Kia ora, I'm Claire Finlayson, Program Director of the Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival. The 2019 festival recording that you're about to hear was brought to you with funding from the Dunedin UNESCO City of Literature and with the support of ORFM. This session, Maurice Gleitzman, was chaired by Barbara Larson, supported by the Australian High Commission and in association with the Remarkables Primary School, Queenstown. Enjoy. Well, hello. Good afternoon and welcome to the Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival. I Bar I'm Barbara Larson and it's my great pleasure and honour to be here with children's writer and Australian children's laureate Morris Gleitzman. Our format for today is uh, I'll introduce Morris I'll, um, and we'll chat for a while and then we'll leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Is that okay? Thank you. Morris, welcome to you. Thank you. Um, I'm told your visit, visit is sponsored by the Australian High Commission. Well, I didn't know that, and I'm now a little worried that they're going to put my taxes up when I get home <laughs> just to uh, cover the cost of the trip. But it's very lovely of them to be involved yeah. anyway. Okay. And it's in association with the M Remarkables Primary School in Queenstown. It most certainly is. A school that I'll be visiting in a couple of days' time, and... Can you imagine a better name for a school? In fact, I think every primary school in the world should be called the Remarkables School. Um, but uh, this particular school um, up in, near Queenstown or in Queenstown is the only school, as far as I'm aware, it called the Remarkable School, and I have high expectations of the <laughs> children there and the teachers. Yeah. Now, a few words about our special visitor. Morris Gleitzman, as many here will know, is an English-born Australian author of children's and young adult fiction. He's one of Australia's most successful writers, as well as being a much-loved children's author. He's written 40 books. That's astonishing. Well, not if you divide 40 into my age. It means that I've only written one book every four years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you've won many awards, accolades, and honours. Um, his work is published internationally in over 20 countries, and he's currently the Australian Children's Laureate. Please welcome Morris Gleitzman. <laughs> so, Children's Laureate, that is a major <coughs> honour. Congratulations. Thank you. But with that must come enormous responsibilities. Well, it was in, in the first weeks of my laureateship, it was referred to in the Australian press a few times as an award. And I went to great lengths to say that it's actually not an award, it's, it's an opportunity to do some, some work that I, I feel is really important. Mm -hmm. And um, it's also a concept which has been borrowed from the Northern Hemisphere. Britain or England has had its Children's Laureate for 20 years this year, and Ireland, um, not far behind, and a few of the other European countries. Um, I, I understand that there's a committee working hard, even as we sit here um, somewhere in New Zealand, working towards a New Zealand Children's Laureate, which I think is mm. a splendid idea. And it, it would be no news to, to anyone here that, that, that the job basically, the responsibility basically, is just to do all one can over a two year period to enable as much reading by as many children as possible. But we're encouraged each to have to choose a particular angle or, or, or a particular focus on, on this, in this broad landscape and um, sort of make it our own. And my predecessor, Lee Hobbs, um, very rightly chose to throw his weight behind the problems that um, a lot of our particularly state school libraries are having in Australia for a whole range of reasons. And this is such a big and important thing that I've made it my sort of number two project. And I think every laureate, certainly in Australia, into the distant future, is probably going to have to continue this battle. But I've made my main focus um, one of the, the great loves of my life, which is story. Um, and, and so I'm talking to a lot of adults, actually, because um, there is in the minds of a lot of busy and distracted adults who perhaps have forgotten the place that the stories, the role that the, the stories of their childhood played in their developing lives. There's a tendency to, to dismiss um, fiction for children as just being a bit of fun 
very important in terms of helping young people to develop their reading capacity. But once that's occurred, then it's just a pleasant pastime, which everyone should have in their life, but of no greater um, value than that. And of course, well, I think it's of much, much greater value than that. So, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm talking to groups of adults from parents right up to sort of policy makers and purse string holders about what a terrible loss it is for those children who don't get a rich and varied diet of their own choosing, ideally, of stories throughout their childhood because our responsibility now, we, we adults, to help equip, equip the next generation as much as possible to face what I think is going to be one of the biggest um, ranges of, of, of challenges that any human generation has faced in terms mm -hmm. of making their generational contribution to keeping the whole human adventure moving forward and at least not getting any worse, ideally helping, helping make it a bit better. There's all of the things that, that um, as young readers, that stories um, help us internalise because the, the characters we're reading about have to develop in certain ways to have a, a fighting chance of solving or surviving the big problems that will be at the heart of every story. And the, the creative thinking, the empathy, the problem-solving capacities, the resilience when problem-solving strategies don't work the first time round, which they never do in novels because generally they're first applied on page 37 and the author's contracted to write at least 200 pages. All these qualities, if young people are lucky enough to go on hundreds or even thousands of those different story journeys through their childhood reading, story journeys that will always involve those same capacities and attributes being developed by the main character, it's impossible. If you want to keep turning the pages, you are emotionally connected to that main character. You are imagining imaginatively in, in their shoes. So any process they're going through of internal growth and development, you're going to internalise that as well. Mm. And so those, those young adults, those, those upper teenagers who've, who've had years of those sort of story experiences, who've, um, who've had um, all those unconscious de developmental processes, they are just going to be better equipped for whatever life throws at them and whatever they aspire to in life. Mm. Well, there you go. I've made my laureate um, mission statement and now we can get on to some you know, literary <laughs> gossip and other stuff. Well I, well, I wanted to ask you what holding the position means to you. I mean, what, what effect has it had on you? Um, well, I've written much less over the last 18 months. Yeah, I can months. imagine. Um, but what has more than compensated for that is that it's really the first time in, in about 30 years that I've, I've been able to step aside, at least partly, from, from the sort of um, the book writing treadmill and, and, ha and had a chance to reflect on some of those um, larger um, aspects of, of why we do what we do. And those of us who care about young people and their reading why what we what we hope to achieve not in terms of just the creative um, goals of the next book and you know the sales graphs um, but just in a much broader sense and and this is something I feel very grateful to have had the opportunity to to do and like a lot of sort of abstract contemplation it takes on more meaning when at the same time you are using these developing thoughts and ideas in a practical way, actually having conversations with people who need to have those conversations and who, in some cases, hopefully will change their attitudes, will do a bit of reprioritizing when it comes to making policies, allocating funding, things like that. So it's, it's, it, it's been a wonderful opportunity to, to um, have those experiences for me. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, do you see yourself as uh, like an ambassador for uh, children's books and the, ha and the habit of reading? Yeah, I, the, there is an ambassadorial <coughs> aspect to, to the role. Um, I knew that from the outset, which is why I was so 
disappointed when the Bentley with the flag on the bonnet didn't arrive for my exclusive use for two years. Yeah. Um, but I, I also see myself as a, as a sort of, as an advocate and, and, and an agitator. Um, I think a lot of what I want to say to, to the adults that, that, that I'm, I'm talking to is probably not news to them. It's more, I'm kind of doing a lot of nudging and saying, mm. you know, remember this, you know, I know you once knew this, but now that you've, 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 you're in a position to make, the, make a difference to, to the lives of a lot of young people, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to say, don't forget that once you knew this was important, and it still is, in fact, maybe even slightly more important. Probably even yeah, more yeah. so, yeah, yeah. And, and with, the, with the laureate, um, does it come with formal obligations? Or are you free to sort of um, make your own path? Pretty much free to make my own path. There's, I'm not sure how formal they are. The obli- I, I have a, some sense of obligations. Um, probably not to get drunk and behave disgracefully in public <laughs> and end up in the tabloids is probably yeah, you know, well, an implied one. obligation, which, you know, <clears throat> oh, only six months to go and I can go back to my previous lifestyle. Um, <laughs> but... Um, and there are a few sort of relatively minor ones um, because the laureateship in Australia is funded almost entirely from, you know, government literature board type. Um, mm-hmm. And it's funded very modestly, I also hasten to say. And we had a, an international laureate um, get together at the Bologna Book Fair, actually, a few weeks ago, where most of the laureates from those countries that have them got together and we... Um, we did a couple of public sessions, but then we went behind the closed door and did secret laureate business, which was mostly gossiping about um, the governments of our relative countries and how little tips we have for winning the hearts and minds of, of MPs. Um, and funding was a, was a big thing too, because it varied right. hugely. The Book Trust in Britain, which is a superbly funded um, organisation, um, many of you, I'm sure, will know of their work. And one of the things they do is they administer and enable the laureateship. Now, they are superbly funded because they get money from a lottery, So, um, which I think is no bad thing. I think one of the functions of literature in the lives of young people is to let them know that despite all the benefits of agency and planning in their lives, Life is basically a lottery, so um, so you know there was a, mm. there's a thematic appropriateness yeah. there, yeah. but because we're funded um, at a much lower level, um, one of the things that I and I'm sure future laureates will do will be spending part of our time helping to um, find the right sort of um, um, sort of corporate type funders, and it's a tricky one because. Mm. In the UK, as well as their lottery money, they, they are the Waterstones Children's um, Laureate. And Waterstones, of course, are the big bookshop chain. And that's a, quite a good fit. But I, I think for any company to get a possessive, um, to get that possessive apostrophe is perhaps the, the independence and autonomy of mm. the laureateship is very important. I mean, I've had to put my... Um, my political um, opinions usually worn you know blatantly on, on over my heart aside for two years because this is not a party political exercise at all and um, mm. and in fact you know it, it, it probably the most important conversations I'm having are with people whose views of the world are very different to mine but it's not really uh, you know a time that that um, that one can get into sort of political ping pong. It's, um, yeah. Right. So the Prime Minister isn't going to be ringing you up and asking you to write a happy story for the new Prince Archie. Well, yes. Do you know, Prince Archie, there's, a, there's an opportunity I've let slip I by. I think he's a prince. He's not a prince. He's not a prince because... Oh, just wait. Yeah. He might marry a princess and then he'll be a prince, won't he? <laughs> So I haven't missed my opportunity. Yeah, okay, yeah. excellent. Okay. Because a lot of people in Australia who are still coming to terms with the fact that they have something as posh and archaic as a laureate amongst them, even though I'm the, the fourth laureate, 
still cannot, in their minds, separate the word laureate from the word poet. So mm. the number of people who come up to me and say, ah, you're writing rhymes for children, are you? Looking back at your body of work, 40 books, that's a lot of books, even if you only write what, what did you say? One every four years? Well, they're quite short books in terms of word count. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I've got friends who write fantasy novels, and when you pile, say, five of their books up, I'm thinking of one person in particular, you put five of her books in a pile, and my 40 books next, <laughs> and hers are throwing a shadow on mine, because, mm, you know... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the... Going, just going back to the 40 books, that, that shows a real tenacity of spirit, uh, as well as a fair bit of self-belief and commitment. Do you, do you think you were sort of born to be a writer, or it, does something else drive you to do that? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I certainly like the idea of being a writer from a pretty early age, around um, maybe... 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty much the time when I realised that I was not born to be an international soccer star. Mm -hmm. um, that was, that was my, my, my um, ambition for the first few years. Um, I didn't come from a hugely literary um, world, I guess. I mean, I did to the extent that my, my mother was a keen reader and my parents joined me up at the local public library. Um, pretty much as soon as I'd learnt to read, and, uh, and then I was given a lot of freedom to um, to roam around that library. And most importantly, um, time and opportunity was freely available at home for... We, we actually didn't... These two things don't directly correlate, but we didn't have a TV at home until I was 14. So, right. um, so I guess that was just less distraction for me. But yeah, I did a lot of reading as a kid. But... I, I didn't really come from the sort of background where one would automatically assume that w things one enjoyed doing, particularly if they, if to do it professionally w was as competitive and as um, as unlikely, I guess, as 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 it is. That um, yeah, I it was it was a sort of distant fantasy, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, let's go back to your first book. Um, what prompted you to write a children's book? I mean, you could have chosen any number of things to write about. What, what was it about writing a children's book? Well, for the first 10 years of my writing career, I was a screenwriter, and that mostly involved taking commissions, accepting commissions to write other people's agendas, really, um, either adapting books or stories that, um, that a producer or a director ha had a passionate connection with but needed it to be written. Um, or and I also wrote a, a lot of TV comedy and um, and there was a point um, just a couple of years before I wrote my first book mm -hmm. where suddenly my own characters and my own stories started coming into my imagination and as a screenwriter I'd written mostly about adult characters and occasionally younger ones but when my own stories started to come the, the they were always about people who were 10, 11, 12 years of age. And I was able to write a couple of TV films um, for the newly formed Children's Television Foundation in Australia where the, the, um, where, the, where the main characters were both kids. And a publisher had got hold of those screenplays and thought they would make good kids' books and asked me to rewrite my original screenplay into a book twice. And I never thought of writing a book, it, it, um, mostly because I didn't think you could earn any money from books, and I had a young family at this stage. So, um, but the, the circumstance was that I'd already written a screenplay for each of these stories and been paid for it, which sort of bought me some time to, to turn them into books, even though the advance for the books was you know, a few hundred dollars. Um, but I had a really good time doing that. Mm. And, and it was particularly instructive, I think, to take a story that I'd conceived and developed and written as a screenplay and to experience the extra um, dimensions of, of creative satisfaction um, in actually 
doing away with all of those esteemed colleagues, everybody, you know, from the location scout, actors, director, producer, composer, etc., all the people, the army, the village of people it takes to make um, something for the screen, and just feel that I suddenly had this direct contact um, with an audience, in, in, in this case, readers. Mm. And also, but even more than that, a realization that, um, that when we read a story, it, it is, if it's, if it's well written, it's full of spaces for us as readers to enter with our thoughts, our emotions, our imaginative processes. I mean, this is sort of symbolized by the fact that there are literally spaces between words, whereas images on a screen, just, I know, in the old days, they were squares of, on celluloid, but, but to our eyes, they, they, were, they were just, it was just an endless stream. But the really important spaces and gaps um, are actually in the things in the spaces where things aren't said in a book. And you can or should never try to say as much, say descriptively, in a book as you would on a screen. Because you, you watch, you look at a screen for two seconds and the amount of contextual information is vast if it's just the inside of a room. You would never describe everything in that room, unless the whole point of what you were writing was that somebody was a hoarder or somebody had an obsessive relationship with their personal possessions or whatever. But if the point of being in that room at that point in the story has nothing to do with each and every one of those objects, on a page you wouldn't see them. And because I'm writing for particularly busy and impatient people, life every day for for people when they're 8, 9, 10, 11 years of age, every day life is revealing how many opportunities and interesting um, things to do and think about there are. And so you don't want to spend any more time than you need to in reading a story. It's a discipline that partly comes from screenwriting where it costs, say in a movie these days, it might cost a million dollars for each minute that's on the screen. So any slightly indulgent little side bit of a story is going to cost you know four million dollars, and you can be pretty sure that the producer is not going to allow that. So, screenwriting is actually a very good preparation for writing mm. for young people. Yeah. But so is the 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 realization that just because my readers are physically smaller than um, adults, they it doesn't mean that they have any less capacity to enter into a story and through thoughts and feelings and, and a creative. Um, engagement with what that character is trying to achieve in terms of their problem is just as able as any adult to participate and to, in a sense, help create that story. Because I don't think a story really exists um, until it comes alive in a reader's imagination, but more importantly, until a reader is engaged with its processes and, and is contributing in terms of what that story ultimately means to them, what their experience of it is, is contributing to, to that process. And I haven't done a very good job of, of, of expressing exactly what I mean, I think, but it is an awareness that has never left me as I, as I write stuff to be read via the medium of, of, of words, um, of text, um, that this is so much more um, the relationship that I feel with my readers is that compared to sitting in front of a screen, it is so much more active and contributive on, on the reader's part. Mm -hmm. yeah. did, did you have children at this time yourself? Yeah, my daughter's 37 and my son's th 34. So, um, and I think my first book was published in 85, which must have been pretty much the year that my son was born. Mm. So yeah. you read to them, told them stories? I did, yeah, yeah. Um, I told them stories more than read, mm. I, I, perhaps when they were, but then quite a lot of reading as well. My daughter learned to read quite early and was a voracious reader from the earliest days. My son was quite 
disinterested in reading. He probably for the, the first 10 years of his ability to read, he preferred anything on a screen, movie, video game, whatever. Um, but the day did come that every, every parent is so grateful for when they see it happen, where I saw him reading a book. And it also proved that for every one of us, there is a book that engages us deeply enough, that gives us that sort of transcendent experience that reading can give us. And we only have to read one of those books in our young lives, and that turns us into a reader. And some kids are lucky. They find that book really early. Mm. And others, well, my son was, um, I think he was probably 17. Oh. And of course, I'll be forever grateful to this particular author, now sadly departed, who who's, I don't know, I can't remember why he came to pick this book up. Maybe a friend was reading one. And he then read this particular author's complete oeuvre. And I'd like to take this opportunity to say a public thank you to my colleague, Chopper Reed. <laughs> I, some of you may not be aware who Chopper Reed was. He was, um, he was a criminal. I don't think it's defamatory to say, let's say he was a widely alleged murderer. I can't remember now if he was actually found guilty. He, was a, he certainly worked, his professional, um, his day job was as a um, underworld hitman for a while. Anyway, he wrote, well, a couple of Melbourne journalists wrote a series of very colourful biographies of sections of his life, um, and then he wrote himself a few before he died. But the book that... that that opens, hopefully, each young person to the, the possibilities and the joys of reading. It does not matter what that book is, because once we've had even a glimpse, even a sense of what reading can give us, then we're just we're, we're looking for more. And, and the second author that, that my son, at 17, um, fell in love with was the author of The Count of Monte Cristo. So he went straight from, you know, 30,000 word, um, rather um, colourful tabloid style <laughs> books to, you know, an 1100 page novel translated from French, which certainly had a fair bit of crime and punishment in it, I must say. <laughs> um, and, he, and he did go on to do criminology at one stage. Um, so maybe both Chopper. Who, who wrote Count of Monte Cristo? I've gone blank. Dumas, of course, yes. Well, Messieurs um, Reed and Dumas. Um, certainly, I, I'm grateful to them both. Mm. One of your first books, Two Weeks with the Queen, was published in 1989. Uh, it was a very successful book. It was published internationally um, and was well received. But this was the early 90s, and the storyline must have been highly controversial. Would you tell us about that experience? Well, Although I'd written um, a few screenplays with, with young people as the main characters, and, and, um, and Two Weeks with the Queen was actually the first book, uh, the first such story that I wrote first as a book. It was, it was really where I decided that I really wanted to give this a go, writing um, novels. But I, I still wasn't totally identifying as a writer for young people. This story came to me um, without any sort of conscious engineering on my part. In fact, at the time I lived in the suburbs, uh, in the northern suburb of Sydney, and our house had a big bush valley at the back of it, which contained a um, hundred or so trees, which were the nursery for all of Sydney's fruit bats, thousands living down there. And they weren't much liked by the neighbours who were concerned that the wonderful complex um, aroma of fruit bats because they pee on themselves to ward off predators and it's for I anybody who it. for anybody who likes wine it's like a beautiful aged um, cool climate um, Cabernet Sauvignon and um, <laughs> um, and I mean if anybody if I hear anybody saying oh no don't order that it tastes like bats pee I think brilliant that's for me but um, so I was writing a book about a girl who had a relationship who, um, who lived in a similar house to mine and had a relationship with the bats. And I was planning it, and it was going well. And one afternoon, out of the blue, and it was really the last thing I wanted, I suddenly got this powerful feeling that this isn't really the book I should be writing. 
And within minutes, another story, almost fully formed, landed in, in my mind. And I just frantically scribbled down an outline of this story. And then I was able to write a first draft in four weeks. And the published book is really just a slightly tweaked and polished first draft. You can imagine, I was thinking, this is brilliant. I can write a book in four weeks. That's, <laughs> hmm. If I, with a brief holiday, that's 12 a year. That's probably, you know. Anyway, of course, it doesn't, hasn't worked out that way. This story, um, because I wasn't really thinking of who, who might read it, I didn't have any inhibition about whether anything I was putting in it might be deemed to be unsuitable by adult gatekeepers. But um, quickly, and, and, and a brave publisher, um, a, um, James Fraser, who was a publishing director of Pam Macmillan, luckily was a friend of my agent, um, who was a screenwriting agent, so didn't really know the world of publishing. But James published it, and, and it wasn't published as a children's book, it was just published as a novella. But it quickly found its way into the hands of a few people, a few influencers, as we now call them, who um, cared a, about what kids were reading and who thought it might be a good idea. But a lot of other gatekeepers, because it is about a boy whose younger brother is dying uh, um, of cancer and is sent from Australia to England to stay with an aunt and uncle and takes the opportunity to try and borrow the Queen's personal doctor to get that doctor back to Australia to save his brother. And when that doesn't work, um, meet, it goes to a top cancer hospital in London and meets a couple of gay men, one of whom is um, dying from HIV AIDS. So, that, so there's a few things there that weren't particularly normal or, mm. or commonly touched on in, in, in kids' books at, at that time. And, um, but it meant that the book was different enough that it had some very enthusiastic supporters in the, in the educational world and quite a lot of people who, teachers and librarians who didn't want to touch it at all. But slowly, over the next couple of years, it won a couple of awards. It was slowly sort of shifted. I was helped in the UK a lot because the month it was published in the UK, it was um, the Thatcher government passed an amendment to the Local Government Act. And most school libraries in Britain get significant parts of their funding in the state system from the local um, um, government, local council. And the, because of the way you know, the poll tax works, instead of local rates, they get most of their money, local councils, from Westminster. So the Westminster government has quite a lot of power in determining. And they, they amended the Local Government Act to say that it was um, against that act to, um, to um, in any way promote homosexuality in schools. And there were frantic legal opinions sought, which the conservative end of those opinions said any conversation in a classroom or, or, or book which um, does not show, which, which touches on homosexuality but doesn't show um, gay people as either you know, dying a horrible death or undergoing some sort of conversion um, is seen to be supporting, promoting. So in other words, the, uh, in the month of its publication, my new book was banned in 90% of the schools of Britain, which was brilliant. Yes. There is nothing, <laughs> there is nothing because, um, of course, all those, particularly secondary students, the minute they were aware that this book had been banned, because the banning of it made a bit of press, they, they wanted to get their hands on mm. a copy. So it did much better, more quickly than it would have done if yeah. it had been endorsed. And it's still in print to this day. It is, yeah. yeah. Are all your books still in print? They are, yeah, yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it is, it is wonderful, and I'm deeply grateful for it. I, I should also say that I'm the beneficiary of wonderful um, advances in the printing industry because when, when I started out, um, and, and, and this, has, this has real implications in terms of which books get published, not, not just how long they stay in print, but more importantly, which books get published in the first place. The economies of scale that were needed, this basically, when, when I started out, if you had less than about 5,000 books printed at once, um, the, the cost of each book, if you say dropped it to 2,000, the cost, the, 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 what the printer would charge for printing each one of those books would you know, almost double or, or it would be one and a half times as much. And if you wanted 500 copies, it, it was abs absurdly expensive. And, and the technology has changed now. 
Um, in, in the old days, they would only ever reprint a book if they thought they could sell another 5,000. Now, they, they can reprint books in you know, three, four, 500 copies. And a print on demand. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and this is, there's, an, there's another thing. I mean, this, this sounds crazy because this is getting into some really kind of, you know, corporate sort of practicalities. Warehousing space has gone through the roof over the last 10 to 15 years, mostly because land in our capital and other big cities, well, I don't have to tell you, any of you who've, who've ever been to Auckland and, and um, you know, looked in real estate windows, um, and the land's so expensive, the warehousing. So I know, I'm not going to name names, but I know of publishers who have had to rationalise the stock they keep in, in, in their warehouses, who have looked at each title they have stored there, who have projected what they're going to sell of that title over the next 12 months, and any stock above that number, they pulp them. Because it is cheaper to make a book again, to reprint it from scratch with new everything, paper, ink, etc., than it is to hold it on a shelf for more than 12 months. Mm. So um, these... So the fact now that they don't have to hold them on the shelf, if, if somebody goes into a bookshop um, in Dunedin and says, could I have um, 30 copies for, for my class of um, Maurice Gleitzman's second novel and, you know, Penguin um, see that there's only 17 copies left in the warehouse, they can, they can reprint in a couple of days and... And, and, and it's, it's all viable. And this is, this is incredibly useful and important to the way our literary culture works, mm. even though, of course, e-books are, are becoming a more significant part of it. They're still, it, certainly in children's publishing, I would say less than 10% of my, of, of my book sales are e-books because um, it's, a, it, it's a combination of factors. Young people, they may have the devices that you can store and read ebooks on, but they don't have the means to buy them themselves, which almost always involves a credit card. And the people who do have the means to buy books for young people are often still wedded, not unreasonably, but perhaps a, sometimes a bit too enthusiastically, in the notion that everything they hope that reading and book ownership will do for their, their kids will happen much better from wads of paper than from something on a screen. Th th there's lots of pros and cons to that. You know, that mm. We don't really have time to go into all of it, but it's, it's a really interesting it is, it is, development. It? Um, there's a lot of humour in your stories. I mean, even in your uh, darkest stories, there's still a lot of humour. And <clears throat> you seem to be an innately funny guy. Um, where does... I mean, I, I see humor as part of the creative process. You have to be a creative person in order to be funny, really funny. Um, where does that humor come from for you? Well, my father was somebody who perhaps he had a pretty tough childhood and therefore perhaps slightly more than his average. He liked and had a need to be liked and he used humour in social situations mm. all the time to break ice, um, but also to, to have people feeling good about him, I think. And so I grew up with a father who was, who was always, I guess, as we all do, learning some of the dynamics and structures of, of, of humour from the prose. Um, we didn't have a TV, but there was some great humour on British, I, I grew up in England, on, um, on the BBC um, radio. So, um, and so any, any good humour on the radio was always playing in the house and then, you know, my father, you know, would then do his version of s some mm. of those dynamics and structures. And I wasn't even really aware that it was out of the ordinary, but it's hard not to... Um, I'm a quarter Jewish, so I've got some genes as well, maybe, that, that, yeah. that are a bit oriented in, yeah. in that my, direction. My father was, was a funny man, too. Uh, and uh, 
I think that, for me, that's where... It's more of an appreciation of, for me, but it, I think that's where, mm. where mine came And from. it is incredibly useful. <clears throat> I mean, not only is, does humour... When we smile or, or chuckle, something opens up inside us, and exactly the sort of connections um, that, that an, an author hopes will happen as early as possible in a book between a reader and the character is more likely to happen when we op open up. Mm -hmm. and, that, and even on, on, say, an expositional level where you know, some of the information that you've got to get across about the context of the story and, and the background of the character, um, you can tell that stuff as you know, 19th century novelists used to do at great length before the story actually started. But if you want to start your story in the first sentence in terms of you know, at least hinting about what the problem is and, and, and just having every, everything off and running straight away, humour can be really useful. It can be yeah. a very efficient way of showing a particular um, character, or of, of even, you know, laying, giving some clues about the thematic sort of context of a... Mm. Of a um, I'd, l I'd like to now talk about your Once book series. Uh, this is a series of six books. Uh, the titles are Once, Then, Now, After, Soon, Maybe, and apparently you're working on a seventh in book in the series. Once starts with Felix, who is 10 years old. He's a Polish Jewish boy living in a Catholic orphanage in Poland in 1942. At first, I really struggled with the idea of reading Once Aloud to say a young reader. It's a tough book. But later I realized, you know, I, I was thinking, well, What's going on here? Words like Nazi, Jewish ghetto, death camps, even Poland in 1942, are freighted for most of us here, most of us adults, with such powerful imagery and an overwhelming sense of inhumanity and cruelty. So we bring this knowledge and history to your book. But for your readers, these words wouldn't be, wouldn't have the same loaded meaning. They, your readers wouldn't necessarily know the history. Can you tell us why you started writing this compelling series? I, I believe you have a distant family connection in Poland. I do, yeah. Um, I started out thinking about friendship. I, for, for a couple of years, I, I'd been thinking about friendship and, um, and how it is one of the truly universal experiences. And I, and I thought about the sort of stories that are often written about friendship for young people. And, and there are some very good stories, but they usually, the, the necessary problems that every story must have to be a story, were most usually as far as I could see, problems about the actual friendship, you know, whether the friendship has been damaged by something or, and, and, and the goal of, of the protagonist is, is that the friendship be preserved or renewed or whatever. And some wonderful stories of, of that sort have been written, but I, I was interested in looking at friendship in a, in a sort of a slightly different context because um, being very aware that um, despite all, all our fervent hopes and wishes, um, it is going to be a very challenging adulthood for the young people who are our young people today. We only have to look around the world to see that things probably haven't um, been improving over the last few generations and then in another 10 or 15 years it'll be their turn to to make it their world and to do what each human generation has to do, which is try and advance our human enterprise as, as benef mutually beneficially as possible. Some big challenges to be faced. And, and I've long believed that we owe it to young people 
never to lose sight of the fact that, that we're all capable of our best and the best of possibilities in the future are always possible too. But I think we help equip young people um, to have their best crack at success in that endeavour if they are also aware of the very worst that our species is capable of. So I decided to use my story of friendship in, in that context and I thought it would be a very interesting opportunity to explore what friendship is really capable of, of, of giving us if I placed a friendship between two young people in the middle of the most unfriendly human behaviour on a huge scale. And that instantly to me suggested war. I knew instantly that I was not going to be making up a war because we have unfortunately um, a huge supply of real wars to choose from if you want to write about war. And I didn't have to make any sort of list because of my own distant family connection with World War II, which is simply that my paternal grandfather was a Jewish bloke from Poland, from Krakow, and he sort of invented the gap year when he finished high school in the very early years of the 20th century. His family had a, a, a small company. I'm sure, knowing what the traditions were in those communities at that time, they would have hoped he would join the company with a view to eventually running it, that they would have helped him meet some very nice young women and it would all have been done in a traditional manner. But he wanted to go off travelling, and we accept that that's the norm for, for young, young uh, you know, for, for people of 17, 18, 19 years old today. He went off and travelled, but his gap year became many years, and he, when he finished his travelling, he settled in England and um, married, had children, uh, married a Jewish woman and had children. She died of an illness eventually. He remarried a non-Jewish woman, had some more children, including my father. So I grew up, oh, and it meant that during the 30s and 40s, he and his children were in relative safety in London in a much, despite the blitz, they, in, a, in a much safer circumstance than the extended family he'd left behind in Poland, all of whom, as far as I've been able to ascertain, were killed by the Nazis. And so I grew up realising that he and my father and therefore I had had a lucky escape and, um, and I didn't feel as directly affected by World War II and the Holocaust as some of my Jewish friends, parents and grandparents had been. But when I started thinking about this story of friendship in wartime, um, I realised that this was something that, that I wanted to explore on a personal level as well as yeah. um, on, on behalf of my readers. I, I noticed that Felix, the young boy, you use a very contemporary voice for him. Um, it's, it's quite similar to Ludo in one of your uh, recent books, mm. which is mm. a very contemporary story, mm. um, Help Around the House. But it, was that a deliberate choice mm. yeah. for you? Yeah, it was. I mean... If anybody was at the panel session I was on earlier this afternoon, I apologise because I'm about to say a couple of things <laughs> I said then as well. Um, I, I feel that it can be a real pitfall as a writer to focus too precisely on, um, on, the, on the specific idioms, ways of speech of, of the moment because the, our speech goes through so many transient variations in terms of cultural and, and other, other sort of changing um, <clears throat> fads and, and, and fashions. The things we say, the things that matter most to us that we say, the meaning doesn't change much at all. And I also, with um, the Once series, I w it was the first time I'd written stories that weren't contemporary and I was very conscious how much and I discovered this through years of conversation and listening with young people, how much my young readers assumed that people from the past, because all the representations of them, the old black and white photographs or the oil paintings or whatever, make them look different to us. And, they, and many young people assumed that people from the past were different. And one of my, my aims in, with these books was to remind, um, <coughs> remind readers that people actually weren't in the places that are really most significant their inner, inner lives. They weren't any different. And I think our most authentic language is probably the language we use in our 
in our conversations with ourselves. So I guess I was going for a fairly sort of neutral um, um, dialogue tone, one that was all about its meaning rather than any, any kind of um, idiomatic um, stylizations. I was also often using the, um, the verbal structures of humour. I mean, there are many moments of humour um, in these books, not, not sort of gags, but um, because I also wanted to equip Felix with as many credible personal um, strengths and resources as, as I could. I certainly wasn't going to have him jumping on broomsticks and flying around, but, um, but optimism and creative thinking and, and, and a, a really sort of creative way of expressing his hopes for the future mm. are things that perhaps, well, I know they make kids smile and they make adults who, who see them from a slightly different, slightly more world-weary perspective smile too. Um, and, and so, and also, um, I was aware that I was writing in English um, dialogue that would have always been either in Polish or German in the books. Felix is Polish and many of the other characters are German. So, it, you know, there are, there are terrible pitfalls you can get into if you, if you get too hung up on the surface of the language rather than what it's, what it's actually saying. Uh do you want to tell us what the seventh title is in the series? Do you have a title for it I yet? I do, I do. It's called Always. Okay. And, and it will be the final book in the right. series. And I realise by saying that um, I'm, you know, I'm leaving myself open to the um, small embarrassment that, I can, that a couple of um, writers, Australian friends of mine, some of you may know John Marsden, was quite emphatic when his Tomorrow series ended, that it had ended, and then... A few years later, he somewhat shamefacedly released um, the Ellie Chronicles, and um, and my friend um, Isabel Carmody, she took a different approach to it. She just resisted for years actually finishing her series. So it was the Ober Newton Chronicles were meant to have six books, and they in fact now have seven because she kept writing the sixth book to a point where the where our publisher literally had to say, Isabel, you now have too many pages for, the, for the, the architecture of a paperback to actually hold. There is, you know, there is no paperback technology that will provide a spine strong enough to hold you know, 1,200 pages. So they had to chop the book in half, which she loved because she was then able to go on and write an extra 300 pages for that seventh volume. Now, we, I've had a lovely time here asking questions. I, I'd like to open it up to you. Do we have any, ch any questions from the audience? Did you base Goliath off a person from your school? That's a very good question. And before I answer it, can I say how impressed I am that not only were you the first person to put your hand up for a question, you then had to stand up, which is not always easy in public, and use a microphone. That is the big three, and you've carried it off brilliantly. So yes. well, done. well done. Well <laughs> done. Um, for those who may not know, Goliath is a character in a series of books I've written where the characters are cane toads, those well-known but rather unfortunate um, creatures in Australia who, without any personal choice, have found themselves in a somewhat hostile environment, which is extremely conducive to the um, reproduction of their species, but that is possibly why it's even more hostile in terms of humans' reaction to them. And Goliath is, well... I think we all have a, a cousin or perhaps a nephew um, or even an uncle like um, Goliath. He's a big, buffy bloke, big heart, generous, kind, a little bit too sure of his, of his own knowledge. He's pretty sure that he knows everything there is to know about everything. Um, and did I base him on somebody from my school? Well, I think the way I've described him, you can, I don't even have to, you know, say, in spe say specifically that, of course, I did base him on one of my teachers. Oh. But very, very fondly, very fondly. <laughs> um, and only in a general sense, because you obviously are very, very familiar with Goliath. Right? Um, so you will know, for example, that Goliath is quite a competitive sort of bloke. And one of his, um, 
one of his favorite pastimes, he gets a few friends together, other cane toads, and they eat some live mudworms, and then they, they have a competition to see whose bottom a complete worm crawls out of first. <laughs> um, I mention this um, just to you know, show that when you base a character on a real life person, you do it up to a point, but then you add some extra bits. <laughs> because, um, and I also do it lest anybody here not that familiar with my work thinks, well, yes, Morris Gleitzman writes a lot of books about you know, very serious things. Um, I do have a huge amount of fun because one of the great things about writing for young people is that young people are up for anything in their reading. So I'm able to, across the books I've written, are so many different types of stories in so many different styles. And I know sometimes my adult um, author friends you know, look, look at, at, at my list a bit jealously because um, I think in the adult world there's perhaps a little bit more pressure once you're known for writing a particular type of book even if it's just you know, mainstream literary fiction, there's a, there's a bit more of a... It's, it's a little harder to break out of that mould, I guess. Um, it's, you know, if... Um, well, I, w I won't name names. Where did you get the... Imp in Where did you get the ideas to write your stories for, from? Good question. Thank you. Where, where, did I get, where do I get the ideas to write my stories? Well, I'm very lucky. I've, I've never been short of ideas. In fact, now that, I, now that I'm getting on a bit, um, one of the sadder parts of my, of my working life is that I have a lot more ideas for stories than I have time to write them. Um, you, we can all remember, and some of you are either at or about to be at, that wonderful stage in life where you can look around a library or a bookshop c confident in the knowledge that you will get to read all those books. So you don't have to be too choosy, you can just grab the nearest one and enjoy it. And I can remember as a young writer, I would just assume that every idea that came along I felt very lucky to have, and I'd be able to write those books. Where exactly they come from, I'm not totally sure. I know that um, my best subject at school helps me a lot here. Um, um, I was, um, I was, you know, it's, I think everyone at school is lucky if they have a subject they're really, really good at. Um, mine, unfortunately, wasn't an official subject at the school, so it did um, meet with some disapproval sometimes. It, I'm talking about daydreaming, and. Um, <laughs> But I, I've found that I, I, I've just got a lifelong habit of kind of glazing over a bit and drifting off into inner, inner possibilities. And, and some ideas come from that. And some ideas come from the outside world. So, for example, quite a few years ago now, a bit before you were born, I started to notice that on the TV news each night there were pictures taken from helicopters and planes of little fishing boats crammed with people bobbing around on the oceans to the north of Australia. And things were being said about those people on the boats by some of our politicians and others. And they weren't very kind or nice or welcoming things. And I, I was curious as to why Australians, who usually are quite kind and welcoming, were saying things like this. So I did some research to find out who the people on the boat were. And of course, they were asylum seekers and refugees from Afghanistan and other countries up in Central Asia. And I decided that there was probably another story that deserved to be told about those people, and I couldn't see that one was being written by anybody from that part of the world, so I took the liberty of writing it myself. But I still, even with a, a story idea that came totally from outside of me, I still had to go inside my imagination and find some characters who would sort of be, be, the, be the individuals living that story. So making friends with individuals that I meet in my imagination, which was what I used to do as a student daydreamer. Um, and you know, often people refer to the secret friends of their childhood. Some of you um, may, may have secret friends. Um, and, um, and really, I, I, I've, I've talked to other authors about this, and we generally agree that we're lucky because not only do we have to sort of get rid of our secret friends when we grow up, but we actually get to play with them for the rest of our lives and earn, earn a living from, from doing so. Hi, um, I was just wondering, um, do you have a favourite book that you've written? Well, that's a very good question to end with because I'm going to need 40 minutes to answer it. Um, <laughs> it um, no, in fact, of all the questions I might have been asked this afternoon, um, 
it's the only one that I can't really give an answer to because I try very hard not to have favourites among my characters. That friendship I referred to just now, it's a very real thing for me. It happens over um, a year or so before I start writing and by the time the book's published, it's been a, you know, usually a two-year friendship and, it, and the friendship stays with me even after the book's been published. So I've got those character friends from 40 books that I still carry around with me. And it's like any of our friendships, you know, any of, any of our groups of friends. If, if somebody was to come up and say, you know, oh, I've met a few of your friends and they're pretty, pretty wonderful, but um, tell me, just between you and me, who's the best? Who's your favourite? You know, if you're all on a boat and it was sinking, who's the one that you would save and, you know, kick the others overboard? Um, and I don't think we would feel comfortable actually, you know, answering that question. Mm except perhaps on our birthday when we see what they've given us, but apart from that. So, um, but I, I, if you hear me talk about a range of my books, I, I'm sure you, you will notice that Felix, the main character in these six, soon to be seven books, I've had experiences with him, um, imaginative, emotional, and, and he's taken me to Poland to walk the streets where my grandfather grew up and the other members of, of his family, and I would have to say he's, he's my special character for all sorts of reasons. Good. Please join me and thank Morris Gleitzman. Thank you. That was very good. This Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival recording was brought to you with funding from the Dunedin UNESCO City of Literature and with the support of ORFM. The festival receives help from many corners, but we'd like to give special thanks to our major funders, Creative New Zealand, the Dunedin City Council, the Otago Community Trust and the Lion Foundation.